Hello everybody, my name is Eric and today we're going to be talking about zero trust security, how you can get it today, the different solutions on the market, from what you can do right now at home to our sponsor and friends over at ThreatLocker, the premier enterprise zero trust security. So first of all, before we get into how to do it, what, what does it mean? So if you lock your doors, you're already using zero trust security in real life. Zero trust means rather than assuming that applications are trusted, you're assuming that they are untrusted unless you have evidence. And that can either be an application being approved, or it can be, as some simpler solutions will use, something like a digital signature that gives it a level of trust. So today we're going to be looking at some options in addition to how you can improve the security of applications that are running by locking them down and controlling the network. So first of all, what is smart app control? Well, we can go here. So when you install Windows 11 on a new computer now, this is automatically set to evaluation mode. So some of you might actually have this on as you're watching this video. So in evaluation mode, well, we can read the official Microsoft documentation about it. And of course it can be turn turned off and it will automatically be turned off if during evaluation mode it is found that you're not a good candidate for it. So. When a developer creates an app, they're encouraged to sign the app using a digital certificate that verifies their identity, that the app is really published by them, and that the app hasn't been tampered with. Because when you have a signed piece of code, uh, if you edit it using a hex editor or any other method, the signature is now broken. That's the value of signatures. Now you have to either reinstall Windows or still be on evaluation mode to use this. The reason for that is because once you've got software on your computer, uh, there could be untrusted stuff, and just Windows doesn't let you do it. So let's check this out. So we're going to turn it on. We're going to agree to this. And now it is on. Now we can turn it off, but if we turn it off, we can never turn it on again. So now let's see how this works. So first of all, let's try download something homeless, like 7-Zip. I think this is the real site. Ooh. Now because this isn't digitally signed... We actually can't download it, although I believe there is an alternative on the Microsoft Store. Now, this doesn't limit you to the Microsoft Store, but it does limit Nanozip. I don't know why I thought it was PZip. This is one that you can have. So it doesn't limit you to the Microsoft Store, but it does limit you to signed applications. So this is no longer executable. So now we've got this. You may be thinking, why do we install 7-Zip? Because we need it. But just to demonstrate this, uh, let's download something else that is a very commonly used application, Google Chrome. Much as Microsoft might wish that you wouldn't switch to Google Chrome, it even injects JavaScript into the page. But here we go, we got Google Chrome installing, and we didn't get the same error message that we did before, and other applications are going to work like this. If they're properly signed, now let's download some legitimate software and see what happens uh, when we download something that has no virus 2025. But, uh, it's coming from a Soviet Union domain, which is a sign of trust. And we've, there, there's nothing fishy about what's going on here. Now, I'm also, if there, okay, it's not a download ad. If there was a download ad, I would also try that out. Oh, here's a download button ad. And let's see if we can download some more high quality software. So let's see, does this one work? It does. So that shows the other limitation is this only works against unwanted, unsigned applications. Now, for the sake of being legally cautious, I will point out that uh, that application is not malware, but it is something you almost certainly didn't want to install. Oh, I must have forgotten the password, so I'll just go back and get it. Okay, it's 11.22. With any luck, this really nasty info stealer that is probably undetected by antivirus... Uh, beautiful. Beautiful. Doesn't work. So there we go. That's small app control. Now the next thing I'm going to show you is called Tiny Wall. Now Tiny Wall is not strictly a zero trust solution in the same sense as the other programs we're going to use, but it does allow you to deny by default network access, which can prevent a lot, but not all, of the risks. Open source, 
free. We'll see if it's digitally signed. It is good. We can set this up. And this is definitely an imperfect layer, but it is valuable. And this one I would recommend for absolutely everyone, because this one, this one will just make you safer. This one is, uh, this one has no drawbacks. So we can go through and we can see, okay, how do we want to set this up? Uh, and we can go here to select which applications we want to have network access. Things that are not on that list will not get network access. This simply gives you a more secure default than what you get with a normal program. Uh, Windows Firewall by default only blocks incoming connections by default. It doesn't block outgoing. Now let's see if this is included or not. No. Our firewall has shut down this uh, sketchy Google Chrome knockoff. Now I'm going to turn off small app control so that we can see what effect this might have on our info stealer. Now, as you can see, we can no longer turn it back on. If your small app control looks like this, you're going to have to reinstall Windows if you want it. Note, Microsoft, if they, if from your early computer usage, Microsoft finds that it would not block most of the applications you use, it would probably have already enabled itself. So now let's try this out. Let's see. Oh, and Windows Defender, I completely missed this because I haven't done anything to remove Windows Defender from this VM. So the only thing that could possibly save us at this point is Tiny Wall. And it looks like Tiny Wall has come through because this MS build is almost certainly a Luma Stealer, and instead of running, it got blocked. Beautiful. So now it's time to bring out the big guns. These are great at home, and a lot of you are going to benefit from using these. But what, have, what do we have in the enterprise world? Well, this video is sponsored by ThreatLocker, and I'm going to show you what powerful enterprise zero-trust security looks like. Okay, so now we're going to set up ThreatLocker. Now I'm going to walk you through the whole process of doing this. So you can see how it's done, and then I'm going to show you some of the things that it can do, and we'll try the same tests that we tried uh, before. So, of course, the first thing we go we do is we go to Devices, we can go Install Computer. Now, given we don't have any of these automations, but in many enterprises, if you use either of these, you can actually do it fully automatically, and we'll just go with this one. Go with the Workstations, and it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter which whether you choose the MSI or the stub installer, whichever you like more. So we'll do this, threat locker stub, and that contains all the information that is needed in order to set this up and more importantly, link this with my organization, which of course for me is just the Eric Palker organization. Now threat locker is installing. ThreatLocker doesn't trust things. It works on an entirely approval-based system where no application is trusted until you approve it. The one exception is when you're setting it up in application learning mode, it'll learn what you use. But there's no assumption of trust. No certificates, none of that is going to fool ThreatLocker. And that's great in an enterprise environment, because even if a program is harmless, you probably don't want your employees installing Minecraft and goofing off all day, so you can prevent that as well. Now, in a second, it should be ready to go. And now we can actually see it here. And initially it will run in what's called application control learning mode. This is that everything, it's learning, this is a new installation, and then we can switch it off into secured mode once we're ready to do that. But first of all, we've got this. Now, to load the driver, we'll have to reboot the virtual machine, which we can do. And because it is in learned mode, any software we have, and of course, don't worry, we can still install 7-zip. Uh, so I'm going to install 7-zip while we're in learning mode. And any software, we can still install software while we're in learning mode. That's all going to be effortless. 
It's just going to work. It's just going to know this is something that we use. Now, if we go down to the system tray, give it a second, uh, we should see the threat locker system is now running. And that's how we know that we're being protected. On over to services, you can see, all right, threat locker service. So it is running. But right now we're under learning mode, which means we can still just download software whenever we want. We can still do everything that we could before. Now let's go to our portal again. And given we don't need to install anything else and we've got everything set up, now we're ready to switch to secured mode. Now, of course, don't worry, you can go back. And if you want to install software, that's one of the ways you can do it. So now we have secured mode and I'm going to reboot again to make sure the driver is going and then we should be all good. Now we have granular control. And after waiting a bit, we can now see that the driver is all loaded up. And now we can set things up however we want. Now, we have basically infinite levels of customization. A few of the cool things we can do, one of them is elevation control. Elevation control allows us to restrict what local administrators can do. We can even outright remove administrator rights from a computer. And you may think, why would you want to do that? And what about this old Windows 95 app that doesn't work without it? Well, that's where application control comes in. So we've got 7-zip here, which we use on a lot of things. We can go, okay, so we can choose different policies for this. And you can give it administrator rights without all the rights. So we can go, all right. So what do we want to add to this? So we can go down. We can say, okay, so currently it's allowed. It's permitted. We could use this to either enable it to run as administrator or force it to run as a standard user. I'm not going to do that for 7-zip. But what we can do is go down from permit to permit with ring fence. And we can say, okay, what do we want to do with this? And say, you can't interact with other applications. And the most restrictive is going to be allow only the below, which means if you don't put anything in there, it cannot interact with other applications. Restrict this from accessing files. Now here you can say which files it should or shouldn't have access to. And of course, if you put anything in permit, uh, that's going to block everything else this application from changing the registry, and then you can put an exception in here. As you can say, all right, you can change the 7-zip registry, but nothing else. And the most critical one, if you're worried about spying or anything else, take away the internet. Almost every program doesn't need the internet. That's just eliminated a whole class of vulnerabilities. Let's say the 7-zip update server, or any program's update server, got taken over and started shipping malware. Well, in addition to the fact that ThreatLocker Protect would block it, if let's say it didn't, well, there we go, internet solved. Also protects against more complicated attacks like a ROP chain that could allow an attacker to completely, basically turn your 7-zip process into malware. And depending on how, I'm not, be clear, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with 7-zip, I'm just using it as a demonstration. But if this went truly wrong, you could have depending on how it's configured, like what I showed in that video about Marvel Rivals, remember that game that didn't have the best security practices? It's possible that there's already remote code execution built in with poor controls. Now we got other things, Adobe Creative Cloud, Affinity Photo, alternative to Adobe Creative Cloud, and we can make sure all of these, if we're going to allow them, we don't have to give them everything. Here's BattleEye. This is a really nice SQL IDE. And of course, can't forget Binary Ninja, greatest disassembler to ever live. I, I like it a lot. And we can, but maybe I, you know, I like it a lot, but maybe I want to restrict certain things for whatever reason. And I can do that. Now, reason you might want to do this with something like a disassembler, maybe you're concerned that a zero day is going to allow a malware to take over the Binary Ninja executable. Well, if we lock down the internet, meaning that there's no way to exfiltrate data from within Binary Ninja, we've now potentially made that quite a bit more secure. Now there are other things we can do, storage control. Now the one that I happen to really like here is the cookie controls. So these are, they have community policies, in addition to uh, being able to create your own. You can go to the community page, 
and we can find stuff like a storage thing, or because we want to block vulnerable versions of VMware, we can do that. Beautiful. Now what this means is if by some miracle somehow an info stealer managed to get through, or maybe instead of an info stealer you have an incredibly dumb user, right? And you convince them to just start running PowerShell commands in such a way that it doesn't get detected. Well, in addition to the fact that you probably ring fence PowerShell, even if you didn't, uh, oh, oh no, there's an access denied error. And we can, we can do other things. I mean, the big one is you want to have things like PowerShell lockdown, patch management. And the final thing we're going to take a brief look at is the auditing functionality. Now what this does is it monitors every single thing that happens on your protected VMs. Why is that good? Well, if let's say you had a very determined, malicious user with physical access, maybe it was a rogue employee, it's still valuable, in addition to all of this security, to have a human in the loop with a system that is a key piece of enterprise security. It's called an EDR, an Endpoint Detection Response. And with this, you also get a, a you can get an additional service called the Cyber Hero MDR, which is when the cyber heroes, which are threat lockers certified people, will actually sit here watch. And if anything looks out of place, they will call you up immediately. And in fact, as I found out, if they can't find a good phone number, they'll go through absolutely everything they have on you. When I was first testing this out and made the first video I made on Threat Locker, I got a call from them when I was testing. I allowed a piece of malware to run with ring fencing to see what would happen. And they immediately called me and said, hey, it looks like you just ran Luma Stealer within two minutes. So if somehow something got through, well, at least now you know immediately, which gives you time to react, time to lock everything down, and change the passwords of anything that may have been stolen. So that's going to be all for this video. Please do let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed it. Anything else you want to see related to Zero Trust, Threat Locker, questions you have, I'll try to answer them. Big ones, Zero Trust is a really good system. If you're able to apply any form of it, whether it's going to be an enterprise-grade solution or a simple just making your firewall more secure, you have you are now in the top few percent of security. You now have really good security. You don't have to worry about undetected malware. You are in a much better place than most people. That's all from me for now. Bye.